Hello, everyone. I'm Meredith Hogan, your host from GeekWire Studios, or as you can probably tell, the virtual version of GeekWire Studios since this is pandemic times. And on behalf of everyone here at the GeekWire team, welcome to today's session where we will be talking about healthcare and technology collaborating and innovating in the midst of this pandemic. This has become an obvious inflection point and I'm really interested to hear about what these three companies have been doing so far and where they think this is going to take us. I'm a journalist and podcast host with a focus in healthcare reporting, so I'm really excited to be here today and um, to be helping uh, with this conversation. Based on today's turnout and the number of questions attendees submitted in advance, I know it's going to be a great conversation. We'll try to get to as many of those questions as we can, especially towards the end once we hear from the panelists. Um, this is part of an ongoing series of events that we've hosted at GeekWire in recent months featuring top newsmakers. Before introducing our panel, I wanted to first thank our sponsor for today's session, Primera. They are a longtime supporter of GeekWire's weekly health tech podcast. Um, Primera Blue Cross, if you don't know about them, is a leading health plan in the Pacific Northwest, providing comprehensive health benefits and tailored services to about 2 million people, from individuals to Fortune, 5, Fortune 100 companies. And I didn't realize this, but they've been operating in Washington since 1933. Primera's purpose is to improve customers' lives by making healthcare work better. I wanted to give you a quick programming note. Next Thursday, we'll be having another panel. Um, that one will be a CFO roundtable called Insights on a Changing Economy. And we'll be welcoming chief financial officers from Adaptive Biotech, Rover, and Aptio for a discussion on financial planning, managing risk, evaluating growth opportunities, and the changing economy ahead go to www.geekwire.com forward slash events for more information. We hope to see you there. Finally, a shout out to our GeekWire members who are joining us today. Your membership helps so much to fuel our daily journalism and covering the Northwest tech community. If you're not yet an individual or corporate member, go to geekwire.com slash memberships to learn more. Okay, well, without any further ado, let's definitely dive in and meet our panelists. Uh, first, I want to introduce Stephanie Papes. She is CEO of Boulder Care. Stephanie has spent her career focused on digital innovation in healthcare, working to move the industry forward through venture capital investing, entrepreneurship, World Bank funded research in rural India, and systems innovation at Duke University Medical Center. Stephanie has consulted in Washington, D.C. on emerging programs for Medicaid beneficiaries during the passage of the Affordable Care Act, among other projects. Uh, prior to several years investing in healthcare services and technology out of a $1.5 billion venture capital fund, Stephanie worked in investment banking in San Francisco and New York. She has held strategy, operating, and board roles with leading startups in outpatient opioid addiction treatment, mobile oncology, dermatology, and palliative care management. Stephanie, thanks so much for joining us today. Great to be with you all. Thanks so much, Meredith. Next, I want to introduce Rob Schweitzer. He is Chief Product Officer for 98.6. Robbie joined 98.6 in 2017, bringing with him more than 20 years of leadership experience in product development, design, customer support, and operations. His resume includes global tier one companies, including Deloitte, McKinsey and Company, as well as Amazon, where he spent more than half of his 11 years scaling the Prime program to more than tens of millions worldwide. And we know that's where that's gone ever since. Uh, founded in 2015 and headquartered in Seattle, 98.6 is pioneering a new approach to primary care. By pairing AI and machine learning with board certified physicians, their vision is to make primary care more accessible and more affordable, leading to better health. Winner of the 2019 GeekWire Award, Health Innovation of the Year, and they are also a nominee in the UX Design of the Year category, of the 2020 GeekWire Awards, 
they are the only healthcare nominee. So good job. Welcome, Rob. Thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate the invite. Great to be here with the rest of the panel today. Looking forward to the conversation. Last but not least, I want to introduce Rick Abbott. He's Vice President, Pro Product and Market Solutions at Primera Blue Cross. Rick joined Primera in 2018, coming from Imagine Health, a startup focused on creating high-performance health plans for national employers. Prior to Imagine, Rick served as VP Customer Success at Castlight Health, Vice President Health Plan Services at Health Data Management Solutions, and worked as a Senior Manager of Data Use for Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan. Rick, welcome. Thank you, very excited to be here. All right, so to kick it off, I want to back up, hit the rewind but button to this magical world before COVID hit when things were much, much more normal. Um, Rick, can you sort of set the stage for us of where Primera was in serving your 2 million members um, as far as technology goes? You know, what, where were you? What, what were patients asking for at that moment? Yeah, it's almost hard to remember more than six months ago. It seems like we've been living out of our homes uh, for such a long time. Um, but two years ago, actually, uh, we made a decision that we needed to find ways to really do three things. One, improve the amount of access our members could get from the provider community to augment the brick and mortar capacity that we already have through our local provider partnerships. Two, find a way to make it convenient to where perhaps waiting multiple days for a medical visit could be brought down to maybe just waiting three minutes. And then three, find a way to continue to fight the continu continued inflation of healthcare costs. Make this convenient care available at an affordable price. So both of the companies you're gonna hear from today were two of the first we reached out to, and to give you a little context on both, 98.6, um, uh, still a relatively young company at the time, had just started making a ton of noise in the employer community. They were bringing on-demand free access to primary care in a way that we had not seen before through chat. I don't know about you, but I love the idea and continue to use their product of just sitting on my couch and speaking with a doctor via chat. It's incredibly convenient. The idea I can do that at zero dollars was just unprecedented in the market. Similarly, um, one of the statistics that we really found frightening uh, with our members was nine in 10 people who need access to substance use disorder treatment do not seek it. There's a lot of reasons around cost, stigma, their ability to get away from work, et cetera. And we thought, is there a way we can actually recreate the residential treatment center in some ways, in a digital manner, bring it to people at a lower cost, reward the provider who can actually improve their lives by focusing on outcomes, and do so again in a convenient way. So well before COVID, we were starting to explore with these solutions. But obviously, six months ago when the world changed, we were really happy we had spent that year investing in them. Uh, because they became incredibly relevant at that point. So it sounds like you had gotten actually in a pretty good position to sort of react to uh, the pandemic occurring. I'm curious if there was anything that sort of led you to kind of get that, to get those initiative in gear. And I, and I wonder if as part of that, especially because we have some audience members who aren't part of the, the healthcare technology community, but are part of the technology community at large, like how is healthcare doing right. in technology innovation at that moment? <laughs> I'll be honest, and I would guess many of the people uh, watching us right now, when you think innovation and technology, you don't think health insurance. And there's a reason. We generally lag five, maybe is a nice way of saying 10 years, when it comes to embracing technology the way the rest of the world does. Every other industry moves forward pretty quickly, adopts and is able to move forward in a way that we aren't able to. We need strategic partners who understand technology and the practical application of it to healthcare problems. So when we realized that there were solutions that our members needed, again, a year and a half ago, to really use the power of technology and harness it in a way to improve the overall care experience, we didn't want to look inside to create that. There were companies already solving that problem. So we began purveying the entire landscape to say who is actually uniquely suited at this point in time, but also understands the problems that we're trying to solve as a health insurance company and can help us tackle those in a quick way. And the two we're talking to today are two preeminent examples of how that can be done effectively. 
And why is the health and why is the healthcare industry a little bit behind? Why is the insurance industry a little bit behind on technology? What were, in short, some of the barriers? Yeah, there's a couple of reasons um, that are all somewhat interconnected. I mean, healthcare is complex. It involves insurance. It involves doctors. It involves patients. Um, it's endlessly personal. So it's not something where you can innovate quickly because there are rules and regulations around what we can and can't do, what we can and can't share, how much data we can share freely. Um, and honestly, it's a wildly profitable industry overall. Uh, it's 20% of our GDP. Um, it drives a large portion of the economy and the incentives are not always aligned in a way to put the patient first. I'm proud of Primera, I think we do. I think we are focused on making healthcare work better. Um, I think we serve by example in what we do. But when we look broadly across this entire country, there's a lot of things that serve as barriers to really embracing innovation. That's a great way to summarize it. Okay, so now let's return, return to COVID-19 pandemic time. So um, we start realizing that the pandemic is going to be a global challenge. And Primera, no doubt, must have been very busy just handling the frontline impact of that. So tell me about how, you know, based on the fact that you had done some good groundwork of saying, hey, we need to uh, increase our technological access for our members. We need to get off of the telephone, being the exclusive sort of virtual healthcare experience, and, and start getting some new programs in place. How did you juggle both handling the frontline COVID-19 impacts while also saying, we need to do, do some stuff on the back end to make this all go better for our patients? Yeah, it's interesting. When I think back to when, for instance, Primera um, decided we were gonna send our employees home, the thought was a couple weeks. Um, but quickly, within days, we realized this was going to be more like months, if not longer. And sh within that same time period, a number of provider systems had to close their doors. So people were being told, physically, you need to stay in your home. Do not leave. And also, if you do have to leave to seek care, the only place that's going to be open is the ER. But don't go there because you don't know what else might, you might encounter when you get there. COVID may be the primary uh, patient concern in that ER. So... I remember it was a couple days after we were sent home, uh, we made the decision that if we're not gonna be able to enable access to physical locations, we need to bring an abundance of virtual access as quickly as possible. We reached out, I actually remember where I was in this house, both to 98.6 and to Boulder Care, and said, we wanna make you available to all 2.2 million members as quickly as possible. And the time frame we're thinking is like two weeks. Generally, an implementation of this level will take a couple of years, maybe 18 to 24 months. Um, but we, we, luckily, to your point, we were well ahead. We had already done the groundwork to understand how our, two, our three companies could work together. But also, there was a sense that we needed to step up to meet this unique point in time. About two weeks later, we launched 98.6, and about three weeks later, we launched Boulder. We let our entire membership know that if you need care right now, these are places that are convenient. We waived all the cost shares at the time, so we removed any financial barrier to actually seeking that care and said, you don't need to leave your home. It's available 24-7, 365, and can solve a substantial portion of your healthcare need. That wasn't to say, for instance, that everything could be solved, but a lot of things could be solved. So being able to step up to meet medical need and behavioral health need and do so with partners in two to three weeks time period, I will say was unprecedented, but we did it. And to this day, uh, through the end of the year, our members are benefiting from that. Um, and they're still receiving the benefit of the financial barriers we removed as well through 1231 of this year. Uh, anytime you use a virtual visit, it is free. So it's been a really, really cool thing uh, to be able to collaborate with them. on. That is a really impressive timeline, uh, typically 18 to 24 months being shrunk to a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. So I want to hear from you, Rob, about what it was like to get that phone call. But first, for the benefit of the people listening, can you tell me um, what what 98.6 is like for the user? Give me sort of a, you know, a uh, somebody's picking up the app to get started and, and use it for themselves. Can you paint us a picture of what that, what that feels like for the patient? Yeah, it, it, it's much like a lot of the other consumer services that many of us are now used to, whether that uh, is ride sharing, though there's less of that happening now, but it starts with the app. You download the app, uh, pretty easy to create your account and match uh, your eligibility 
to uh, whether it be Premier or, or an employer. And once you've done that, you're in. And then as Rick had mentioned, it's 24 seven, 365 on-demand service uh, across the US and uh, with fully licensed doctors. And you just start a chat, just as you would start a chat with a friend or, or a family member. And, uh, and we take it from there. We, we make use of technology on the back end to uh, automate as much of the tasks that the physician would otherwise have to perform so that we can dramatically bring down costs while also improving quality. So as an example, let's say uh, a parent who in these coronavirus times is trying to get their child set up uh, for virtual school while also getting ready for their busy day uh, with work and their, their virtual calls. They can just from their phone start a visit. It could be pretty much asynchronous if they need to set it down and go deal with their kid needs help, some IT support, come back to it, continue, go over to a work email that's urgent, deal with that, come back to the, the visit. Um, and then so it's on their time. And there's no appointment, there's no wait. When you need it, wherever you need it, for whatever you need it for, we're there. Uh, another example I'd give you, uh, let's say a certain chief product officer who's managing their hypertension and needs a refill of their hypertension medication. Uh, less than eight minute total time to get that prescription refilled, including good conversation with the doc to make sure, even adjust the medication a bit and look at uh, blood pressure readings over the past month. So in a nutshell, you're offering a physician on demand 24 seven? Yeah, there's a physician behind every visit, though I would say we're offering primary care on demand, right? So this isn't just for the emergency? No, no, it is primary care. <clears throat> That's amazing. And I'm curious, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say, I think to the earlier point in, in talking with Rick about how quickly we were able to work together to launch this, I, I think a big part of it frankly comes down to the mission alignment between the organizations and the degree of trust that was built so quickly. So uh, as, as Rick read off what Primero was looking for, improving access, making it convenient, and fighting the inflation of healthcare costs, those are exactly the same things that are in our mission. That's exactly what we are trying to do, is how do we give the highest quality of care to everyone without them having to make a financial trade-off decision in order to get it and to make it as convenient as possible so that there are zero barriers to accessing that care because we believe that doing so will ultimately reduce the total cost of care and the quality of life and health for people. And so that mission alignment that, that was so obvious to the organizations early on, I think instantly built some trust. And then it just came down to what were the must-haves? How do we prioritize ruthlessly in order to, to get what, what all organizations need? Always with the, the members in mind of delivering that care to members. And I'm curious, Primera calls after COVID-19 hits, what was that like for you? To, to describe that moment when you hung up the phone or hung we, up the phone, we I were, guess, to use we a modern, were, modern. <laughs> no, we, were, we were ecstatic. Uh, we had already been working with, with Rick and the Primera team. Uh, the timeline certainly was, was accelerated, uh, which we were thrilled by. We knew there was gonna be a, a lot of work ahead, uh, but we were looking forward to that given the number of members we could serve. With coronavirus already, well, even pre-coronavirus, we were, we were seeing five, six X demand growth just from our own growth from the member base. And then when you layered in uh, the impacts of, of coronavirus uh, and the partnership with, with Primera, uh, it went even, even higher. You know, I think at a particular time we were 10X year over year on, on visit volume, which was just massive. And so there was a bunch of, a bunch of work we needed to do on our end, not just technically, but from, a, from an infrastructure and a, a people and physician perspective as well to, to manage that. But and generally, it was, we, we were thrilled. 
And, and what did that look like internally? How big a, a company were you at that moment? And were you suddenly in a position in the midst of a pandemic and lockdown of needing to hire people? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think at the time we were just shy of a, a couple hundred employees. Uh, I think we had maybe 40 or so full-time physicians and we had to dramatically ramp up our, our hiring plans. Uh, and and did so, and we had to do so virtually to to a large extent as well. But we've been able to do that, and I think really that's a testament to uh, when you talk to to the physicians, the type of care that they're able to provide, and and what they see in ninety eight point six as the future of of practicing primary care. And I'm curious um, for both Rick and Rob, if you can speak to, you know, what were the sort of interesting cultural differences that, you know, you're sort of encountering this, let's ramp up in a couple of weeks culturally, how did that work out? Were, were there pain points? Were there points where one company gave the other a little bit of a kick in the butt? Um, I'm curious. I'll let Rick go first. Yeah, honestly, I felt like um, for the most part, we actually were really aligned. It was such a scary time. Um, we knew that we had something that had to be done incredibly quickly. Uh, we knew that the need was going to continue to increase. He mentioned sort of the 10x growth that they saw just that month. To give you a sense of how fast our virtual care utilization grew as a company, we had 3,000 visits in February. We had 70,000 in March, and we had 250,000 in April. So talk about ramping. It was an incredible pace. Um, obviously, that sort of pace will cause friction at times. You're working 24-7 to get something out the door. So I think we both gave each other, each other a little kick in the you know what every now and then. But um, I think there was sort of a devotion to the mission and a recognition of how this was not like anything we had seen before. And there were people that were going to suffer. And our work had incredible meaning. And I think we stepped up. Wow. So Rob, for you, 3,000 to 70,000 to 250,000. Did I get those numbers right, Rick? In ramp up. What was that like for you guys? Uh, yeah. We, we had a piece of that, just to be clear. We, that that okay. wasn't all to us. Okay. Uh, we had a piece of that. It, it was a massive, it was massive, massive lift. Uh, but I think what motivated us all is at the end of, at the end of that, are a bunch of members who need care and are seeking seeking help. And uh, there's you know very few missions I've come across uh, where you can throw yourself into your work and know that you're having such a positive impact on people's lives. Great. And Stephanie, I want to turn to you. Um, I'd love for you to describe what Boulder Care's mission is, and then what it was like when you got that phone call from Primera. Boulder, uh, so as Rick mentioned, uh, we're a provider of substance use treatment through telemedicine, uh, and that includes opioid and alcohol use disorders. So even prior to COVID, um, we have felt this same sense of urgency around mission. And in many ways, prior to COVID, you know, the opioid crisis was the defining public health issue of our lifetimes. And now we're seeing that made significantly worse as we experience social isolation, a lot of stress and an economic downturn, shortage of supply of substances or medications, and even lower access to providers who can treat addiction treatment for addiction treatment. So we um, are so lucky to be partnered with Primera and now expanding access to the entire uh, book of numbers. And it was about 18 months ago, actually, that we first started talking to Primera uh, as a very young company. So it was, uh, just as Rob described in, in meeting with Rick, instant alignment on mission, on the challenges that they were looking to solve and expanding access, proving quality of care, and for substance use disorder, really making a major change to the trend we've seen year over year in increased overdose deaths um, and over 80% of our country not having access to a provider who can prescribe medications for addiction treatment. Uh, but also aligned in uh, Premier seeing Boulder's infancy as a strength, um, recognizing that our comparative advantage, you know, a, a large payer with many resources, 
um, over 2 million members and a lot of data uh, to look at over time for a great knowledge base on the challenges and opportunities. And for us as a young company, being able to develop with a customer in mind, understanding kind of the ins and outs of uh, the incumbents and industry, why things are set up the way they are and what we would like to innovate on, and the agility afforded to us as a small company to take some calculated risks um, to experiment and learn together. So we'd already been really partnered for about 18 months, um, working with Primera's incredible team, um, designing alternative payment models, defining the outcomes that we think are most important. Um, and we're initially just going to launch with a subset of members in Alaska. And right as we were getting up and running, um, COVID hit. So that's when the expansion happened with Primera. But as Rob uh, said, we'd already started to see major uptick in demand as the need for telehealth services uh, was escalating and new opportunities were presented from the federal government in lifting a lot of the policies that had been very restrictive um, always really in addiction medicine um, for in-person visit requirements and other barriers to telemedicine care. So with, with that, uh, we've seen an increase in um, members from Primera and all over uh, our coverage areas in the Pacific Northwest and opportunities to treat people who may not otherwise have looked for telemedicine or looked for treatment. Uh, and so that's been an incredible uh, change for us as a team to, um, you know, finally be able to reach people the moment that they need care without some of the barriers that have stood in the way in the past. Uh, and with a partner like Primera to help us, um, you know, experiment with uh, our model in a very wide range of demographics from uh, people in some of these Alaska villages that have shipments of medications and supplies only once a week by plane, um, as well as employees to major tech companies based in Washington with hundreds of thousands of employees all over the country. Uh, so it's been an anchor partnership that is uh, an absolute dream for an entrepreneur, and our team is um, very excited about the opportunity to, in a really difficult time, uh, be making an impact. Yeah, that's amazing. And I just want to do a little uh, note to our audience. Uh, you, the chat is disabled is what I understand. But if you have questions for the panel, we'd love to hear from you. So definitely jump into that Q&A section and you can ask uh, your questions and we'll get to them here in a couple of minutes. Wow, that's, that's an amazing sort of launch story that you're describing there, Stephanie. I'm wondering if you can back up a minute and describe what is it like to use your service for someone who is seeking help with their addiction? What does that look like day to day? I think it's helpful to look at what sort of the status quo has been for seeking substance use disorder treatment in our country. Um, I mentioned that the vast majority of communities don't have any options for physicians or nurse practitioners who can prescribe medications for addiction. And we know that medication cuts the mortality rate by half or more, um, as well as helping to curb cravings and stop withdrawal symptoms so that people can be physically stabilized. Uh, and then we can work on other aspects of their recovery. So historically, what we've done is send people away uh, when they have uh, an opioid or alcohol addiction, send them to rehab. And there's a, an, a mantra, you know, rock bottom, that you must wait until someone is very, very sick before offering them any treatment at all. And that's just not what we see in the data or uh, now in practice when people are able to get accessible care from home with, you know, low barriers to entry. Um, we can make incredible incremental strides and help support them and keep them safe, most importantly. So uh, it's um, really designed around being able to expand access to people without a, an in-person visit, without leaving work or your family for 30 or 90 days as uh, you're required to an inpatient, um, but still providing all the evidence-based support. So medication, uh, peer recovery coaching, and um, really holistic wraparound services all through telemedicine. Uh, patients only need to download our app and they'll have access to an entire dedicated team. So we have prescribing clinicians to offer these medications, help with all of the co-occurring medical and behavioral health needs that we often see uh, for people with addictive disease. Um, care advocates, a role that uh, really helps coordinate many aspects of a very confusing healthcare system. Um, from pharmacy issues to referrals to other providers or intakes 
as we treat individuals from the emergency department or primary care uh, or other community-based organizations. Um, and finally, peer coaches. Peers have lived experience in addiction, so really connect to our patients with empathy. They've either been through the legal system or been a, a pregnant mother in recovery. And when we have patients with some of these needs and um, circumstances, it's wonderful to have someone who has been through that before. Uh, they also have specialized training and some of the social determinants of health, helping navigate to food banks or uh, obtain Narcan for safe use. Um, so collectively, the care teams at Boulder work behind the scenes to ensure that every individual has a, a treatment plan that meets their needs. Uh, and they're very well connected and coordinated. Um, and patients have access to them at any time through text messaging in our secure app or through video visits. Uh, so one thing we really do know about addiction is that it's a chronic condition. It's not something that uh, tends to be curable in 30 days, but people are very successful if they have support over time. Uh, so if we expect people to be able to access care for months or years, um, technology is just an amazing way to make that not a burden on the on the patient so that they can get back to work, school, parenting, or whatever else they have going on in their lives instead of spending it constantly commuting to a clinic or away at an inpatient facility. Right. It's a practical daily solution. Um, so I'm so you were kind of at the moment of launch. You were, you were just past launch or you were pre-launch at that at, when 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 COVID hit? And how big were exactly. you? Exactly, we essentially just started. Um, as a team, I think we were about 40, uh, and we had been growing very quickly. We, um, fortunately, were already planning a, a very uh, pivotal year of growth as a, um, a venture-backed company with a huge problem to solve prior to COVID. So we were uh, ready to ramp, and one of the major I think differentiators of Boulder's model is that our care teams are all full-time. They're employed with Boulder, very close to the mission and to our guidelines. Um, so we are able to, you know, ramp pretty quickly and still stay very connected to um, patient care and, and develop those really, um, you know, critical relationships with the people we care for. Yeah, I'm curious, Rick, what was it like to know that you were calling, uh, especially relative to Primera, a very small company? Yeah, it was, having worked in sort of a similar space prior to Primera, it's one of those, it's a blessing and a curse all at once. So you look for a great opportunity to show you can step up, and we have some of the largest technology companies in the world as part of our client base that you're gonna to need to support and cut across 50 states. The other side of that is, yeah, you are have this sort of staged growth that you're thinking about very meticulously, and when you wanna hit certain milestones, and then everything changes in the course of 48 hours. Um, and I think to their point, their model was very, very strong to be able to ramp very, very quickly. Um, so they were able to, to meet, obviously, that point in time with us and, and serve the members that we have. But it is um, a difficult dynamic to go from, you know, 40 employees to all of a sudden needing to support 2.2 million people. Um, and they did it really, really well. Yeah, and I'm curious, Rob and Stephanie, if you can sort of describe the size of your company or sort of the percentage growth before Primera called and then after Primera called, roughly speaking. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure financially, you know, as, as, a, as a resource, this was a big change for both of your companies. Rob, you want to kick us off? Sure. Uh, yeah, Primera's two plus 2.2 2 million members is a, a large material growth for us. How about you, Stephanie? How would you characterize the, the change for your company from a size or resource standpoint? I think it's a combination of new Primera members and those, you know, during the COVID uh, public health emergency, we've seen about a tripling of patients on our panel um, and continues to grow. Unfortunately, as overdoses continue to escalate as well, there's been about a 20% increase in opioid overdose since March or April. And already, um, you know, we had 70,000 Americans lost last year. So that is uh, another dimension, I think, that adds a sense of urgency to the work that we do. Um, these present moments are so critical for families who are suffering with a loved one or people themselves who um, are seeking treatment and, and need support right at the moment they need it. Yeah, absolutely. 
So I'm curious if, if, you know, and feel free to raise your hand or just chime in if you're the best person to talk about this. I think as we, we think about telehealth opportunities, um, a lot of patients, what's top of mind is, is privacy issues, security issues. You know, we've heard terrible stories of, of, you know, Zoom classrooms being hacked and stuff like that. So how did you guys think of that as a group and as you were thinking about innovations and, and a very quick rollout? Yeah, let's... One of the things about healthcare is we do have a set of guidelines within HIPAA that say what we can and can't do. But in another way, this is a little bit different. Um, for instance, when you're working with 98.6, you're generating uh, a transcription of a chat. Uh, but Primera, immediately up front, and to 98.6's credit, uh, this was a principle they had coming in. We weren't going to ask for it, and they weren't going to give it. That encounter with you and the physician is something that needs to be held sacred and private. They keep it. We have no idea. Uh, actually what's happened. We just see the claim come through so we can pay it on your behalf. Same with uh, Boulder Care. All of the discussions you have with your prescribing physician, with your, uh, your coach, et cetera, Primera sees none of that. That's all held very sacred at the Boulder Care side. So we knew right up front that we were going to draw those guardrails very clearly, even when there was the ambiguity um, up front around exactly how much interoperability with one another we might want. So we decided to err on the side of conservativeness and caution. Um, and try to treat them the way we would treat a member who's just going to a physical facility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and Rob and Stephanie, it would be great to, to hear how you think, because your, your care is, is based on something that, you know, is thrown into the car, you know, kids can grab a parent, and, and how do you safeguard your app environment um, security and privacy-wise? Go ahead, Stephanie. I probably should because substance use actually has an even higher bar than the already pretty stringent requirements for HIPAA and rightfully so. Unfortunately, information can be used against people in a number of ways from losing a job to threats from the legal system. And so we take that really seriously. And it's a huge investment uh, for a startup you know, to spend what we do in compliance, legal and security is not an easy thing to do, but we knew from the beginning was critically important as part of our promise we make to partners and to patients. So addiction being a particularly sensitive and stigmatizing issue uh, also gives us, I think, an advantage to be that credible partner so that someone doesn't need to worry about their employer or their health insurer, uh, you know, seeing their personal data as uh, older can be reassuring that we keep these things very, very private. Um, we have special protocols both in the technology and in how we exchange information with other entities. So we um, need patient consent for anything that we do, anyone we talk to. We try to bring family into care if it's helpful and work with primary care, uh, but only with the patient's express permission. And technology has actually given us, I think, even better ways to do that. We can send secure forms, um, help uh, you know, translate some of the legalese for folks and work with them pretty closely so that they understand exactly how their data are being used and um, are comfortable, uh, you know, knowing that, again, this condition is um, one that can, uh, you know, really even heighten the sense of uh, security need for, for the individual. And Rob? Yeah, I, I would add that um, patient trust is, is crucial and critical. I, I mean, there is, patients are not going to come to you if they do not trust that, that you are taking care of their information and uh, being a good steward of their information. So as, as Rick said, uh, aside from meeting the HIPAA, uh, guidelines. We, we have our own internal policies of, of what we uh, do and do not share, uh, whether it's aggregated or, or not aggregated with the partners that, that we work with. Uh, I think there's a similar question and story in here as we've worked with some of our employers during coronavirus uh, around return to work opportunities and certainly where you've had uh, employers ask to receive information about uh, you know, particular members testing positive or not and whether they should come back into work. And we're like, nope, sorry, we, we don't share that. That's not something that's, that's shareable. Uh, and uh, patient trust is, is everything. And I'm curious if each of you could take a turn on this one especially given the pressures of COVID, of, of the pandemic uh, happening as you're trying to roll this out, what were your top one or two, what, was the, what were the top one or two things that you think helped make this go quickly and well? I wonder if Rick, you can kick it off. 
Yeah, um, health plans are notorious for allowing perfection to be the enemy of really, really good. And when you're working at the pace with, with which we were, um, under the significant stress that we were and the demands that we were, um, it's difficult sometimes to, to remember, and this is just as a health plan, that you know what, you might not get it right, but being uh, quick is every bit as important. So we did as much as we could as a health plan, recognizing there might be some things down the road that we'll have to figure out around our collaboration. Um, but that's okay, because the most important thing that we could do was put healthcare in the hands of our members at one of the most urgent crises of their time. So I think for us, we constantly have to remind ourselves of that. Um, two of the values we have are do the right thing and be excellent. Sometimes you got to give a little bit on the excellence just to make sure you're doing the right thing and meeting the point of view. And I think that's what we try to remind ourselves since then in every project that we do. Stephanie, I'm curious what one or two things really helped you guys speed ahead in, in innovating at that moment. I think certainly as we've talked about a few times on this call, a commitment to mission and recognizing the reason that we do what we do, um, but really a shift, just as Rick said, in the framework for decision making when you're looking at relative risk. We may, you know, miss um, a couple of deadlines or you know, not check every single box, but when loss of life is the alternative, you know, we're protecting um, frontline healthcare workers by keeping people safely at home. We're giving someone um, reassurance about their symptoms and helping them find the right source of care immediately before anything, um, you know, can put them in harm's way. And so that way of thinking is how most, I think, industries innovate, really uh, moving quickly and we're, so fortunate in so many ways that we found a partner in Primera um, who had the same objective when uh, we were really tested and pushed by this public health crisis. And two, it just would have to be people, and that's really on all teams. Um, in Boulder, uh, an amazing group of individuals from um, you know, medical care to research and academia to engineers, um, product folks. And all of us really coming together and recognizing that each of our strengths were critically important in this implementation and build. Um, and on Primera's team, uh, many late nights, emails back and forth, they really did work so hard to help um, us get set up and continue to. So we're incredibly grateful for that partnership. So it sounds like uh, not letting perfect get, get in the way of good, leaving some details to be worked out later great people power and, and some serious dedication. Rob, I'm curious what you would add to that. They, they, it's not adding, it's summarizing. Dedication, <laughs> dedication to mission and to relentlessly improving is yeah. really what it comes down to. Totally. And Rick, I'm curious uh, if it worked, did you, have you been able to see some measurements and some outcomes that you were going for? You know, at, the, at, this, at this point, a couple months in, how's it going? Yeah, uh, it has. Um, it's funny because you can look at it in an empirical way and we do monitor the utilization, we monitor um, the overall quality, etc. But there's sometimes where just the stories you hear anecdotally are every bit as good. And I have, I can't go too far into details on them, but for instance, 98.6, one of our large employers um, had an employee who was a single mother who sent a note through our Facebook page to say thank you for making them available. I've been scared to go outside. I'm scared I might lose my job. I decided I'd forego healthcare for my chronic condition so that I could take care of my son. Uh, but then when my employer made this available uh, through you guys, I was able to speak to a 98.6 physician, get back on track, and I feel like for the first time I have hope in a very long time. That was an incredible story. I have another one with Boulder where um, someone who was struggling with substance use disorder could not find an advocate because there was no place that would take uh, this particular person while they were focused on treatment. And they were advised to actually relapse so they could go back somewhere. It's a horrible thing to say to someone. Um, Stephanie selflessly stepped up, took care of this person, and I know exactly what happened to him afterwards. They are leading a very, very good life. So to be able to do these kind of truly life-saving things, um, to Rob's point earlier, to know you're making that impact is, is really, really heartwarming. And it has worked both from a data perspective, but also from a human perspective. And I'm really, really proud of what we've done. Amazing. 
And that's a great transition actually to one of our audience questions um, from Ryan. Thanks so much for sending that in. Uh, how do you identify individuals in need of care for addiction without violating HIPAA? In other words, do you, do you do any outreach to support individuals who need care? So it's like, how do you get people into the funnel, I guess would be the question. So I'll speak for Primera and then Stephanie can speak for Boulder, obviously. So um, we just make their services well known. So we promote the brand and really promote the why. Like if you are struggling, but you don't quite know where to turn, or you are afraid of what it'll have to be to go somewhere physically, you don't have 28 days or the financials to be able to do so, here's an option for you, check it out. So we promote as much as we can through all of the communications we do and marketing that we do that their services are available. I'll let Stephanie speak a little bit around how other patients might get into. It's a great question. And for HIPAA reasons and for others more practically, we don't do a lot of targeted outreach through calling every member and uh, like some digital health companies do try to look at um, analytics in order to proactively reach out because you can imagine how hard it can be to get a phone call from, you know, a company or your health plan that you don't, you don't know saying, we think you may be struggling with substance use or maybe someone in your family, can we offer you help? Uh, is not, in our view, kind of the best way to start developing relationships um, of trust and, you know, letting people know that our doors are open. Uh, so instead, uh, a lot of outreach in the communities where our patients live, um, very well connected to major health systems, emergency departments, um, and are uh, continually working on research leadership in our field, um, move the industry forward. And as that reputation and, and brand become um, you know, more accessible to folks. We are finding that that chunk of 90% who weren't accessing treatment before, a lot of her besides just not being ready uh, or, you know, not having a place nearby. Um, people may get rejected from treatment for anything from smoking cigarettes and not wanting to stop to being pregnant to having an open legal case related to their drug use. A lot of exclusion criteria at facilities and a lot of judgment often People present at the emergency room in excruciating pain, um, in withdrawal, and are told that because they don't have a medical condition, they aren't going to be admitted, can't get care. And these barriers have made it really hard for folks to come back to the health system and try to you know, find a provider who will actually care for them and give them the evidence-based treatments that should be available to everyone. So um, you know, building that trust and word of mouth referrals are about 30% of our new patients, which we think is a testament to uh, providing really good care and having the you know, social aspect of this disease work for us. People um, recommend trusted um, you know, sources of treatment and that uh, I think speaks to the quality of our program. Um, and finally, just working to be uh, you know, an open door for people who may be pre-contemplative uh, it may take a few times. You know, our clinicians say that if it takes 500 times for someone to really be ready and um, successful in treatment and live um, in sustained recovery for the rest of their life, we want to be number 12, number 40, number 500. Uh, anything that we can do to um, you know, make sure that that person, when they um, you know, are successful, uh, we're there for them and they know that we're never going to let go of their hand. So um, I think it's uh, Addiction has its own, uh, even beyond the rest of the healthcare system, its own nuances that really make it important for us to, to be offering low barrier care and giving people multiple chances and multiple odd ramps. Great. Um, I'm going to take another uh, question from the audience. Have you seen more adoption to virtual care in rural areas where there are fewer providers and specialists in that area? Absolutely. It's actually a focus for us. Um, Rural areas are gonna be harder hit than many others post COVID because the providers who live, live there and work there and are parts of the community um, are gonna be more financially burdened by the economic environment in which we're living. So beyond even losing that type of access, um, in places like Alaska that we do serve, uh, sometimes there are climate barriers to being able to seek care. Uh, Stephanie mentioned earlier that some places, once a week, a plane comes in and brings all the meds. You can imagine during the cold season how easy it is to find a physician within 40 miles, let alone make it to that office. Um, so we have a huge focus on rural healthcare. 
Um, we have a huge focus on social determinants of health that are also part of what drives rural healthcare um, issues. And we think there will be an incredible opportunity um, to be able to support our local communities by using virtual care effectively. The, the other one that I would add there is uh, those with mobility challenges, right? Uh, that's another segment of the population that, that we've seen as a huge adopter of, of telehealth services as well. Amazing. Yeah, so, and Stephanie, you sort of alluded to this earlier that, you know, Primera's call, I, I sense, helped you think about your mission a little bit with a little bit more focus. You weren't just sort of, you know, dreaming up ideas, you know, sort of in a vacuum. You were like, okay, we have to do some things very focused on this large, large uh, partner that's, that's come up. I'm wondering if each of you can talk about um, how what initiatives are next for you and if any of those initiatives have changed as a result of of covid or this partnership rob would you like to kick it off sorry you you broke up a bit on on my end can you sure no problem yeah so i'll i'll ask again so what's next for your company and was it influenced at all by the premier partnership or covid19 generally yeah. Um, well, I think what's next for us is, is we continue to grow, uh, not only as a company, but, but with Primera. And uh, what's interesting, and, and I don't think we've really talked about, is uh, beyond COVID and, and coronavirus and being able to provide access to Primera's members, uh, working with Primera on, on another offering that uh, we consider to be extremely innovative and frankly didn't think that we'd have a chance to work on with a partner for several more years. And we were ecstatic when Primera came to us early in, in the partnership and said, we have this idea we'd like to, to run by you. And uh, as we talked about it, we said, yeah, we, we've been thinking the same thing and we'd love to, to work with you on that. Fantastic. So uh, a meeting of the minds. And Stephanie, I'm, I'm curious what's next for Boulder Care and if it's influenced at all by this partnership or, or COVID-19 generally. Similarly, continue to grow, expanding deeper in the Pacific Northwest and now nationally to support enterprise accounts uh, and employers with Primera. Um, Primera having kind of that range in, in you know, both employers and direct to members uh, in the states of Washington and Alaska has let us understand where we can lean into some strengths in rural care or very, um, you know, culturally specific, reaching underserved demographics, uh, as well as underserved um, patients in general for getting treatment for their conditions. Um, so we're developing special programs around those things, including um, care for HIV and hepatitis C, um, LGBTQ specialized and focused on uh, women's health and uh, minorities. So I think these are, um, projects we're excited to just continue, um, and that includes Primera members and um, others across the country. And also uh, really investing in um, our technology and the ability to use some of the information that we're learning and gathering on our members to tailor care even more um, to their needs. So learning where we might be able to intervene predictively uh, if someone is, um, has certain attributes or maybe going through something and improve our care model through data and technology. Um, so we're excited to kind of continue our uh, peer coaching model in particular and social determinants and using um, some of those analytics to offer anything from helping someone get back to school and set goals around that to um, overcoming a legal case and being an advocate for them. And Rick, I'm curious, are you gonna return to pre-COVID tech initiatives going forward or does that, is that the past and you guys are charging ahead into new stuff? Is it influenced at all by COVID-19? What's, what's ahead for you? Yeah, absolutely. So we're gonna try to blend the best of the past and the best of now. So there are some members, I'm one of them, who absolutely love this new virtual world, who like the convenience that it brings to Robbie's point, uh, allows us to bring forward concepts like entirely virtual health insurance, things like that. 
Um, but we also recognize some people really do miss that primary care doctor that they built a relationship of with, for, with for 20 years. And they're really loyal to a specific health system who's able to coordinate their care very effectively. We have 2.2 million members that represent largely rural areas and some of the largest tech companies in the world, and they have a diverse set of needs. We're going to try to marry both to be able to serve all of them and then continue to invest in behavioral health. I think we've only scratched the surface of what we can do of supporting mental health, supporting um, substance use disorder treatment, et cetera. We wanna really focus on pediatrics um, where we know a large number of um, children are just now adjusting to what life's gonna be like for the next year. And with that come a number of things that they're gonna have to work through as well. So we're gonna try to support all of them. I think there's good from the past and there's good from here. And the question will be how we can blend them and make them work collaboratively with one another. And I'm curious too, for Rob and Stephanie, uh, how could a small to medium sized company be ready for a call like Primera to come in? Any advice for the people out there who are waiting for the big partner call? Stephanie, you wanna, you wanna dive in? Oh, I think you're still on mute. Oh, sorry about that. There you go. Um, I think I have to great, uh, give uh, credit to Primera on this. You know, Rick was very intentionally scouring the landscape, looking for like-minded, uh, innovative companies that could help augment Primera's strengths. And so to work with an um, you know, early adopter who can be an evangelist for your product, a referenceable customer, help in the development and design process from very early on, is exactly what a founder in a young company, you know, really look for in that first relationship. So the value goes far beyond just, um, you know, revenue and the membership that we're serving today, which is incredible, um, but really helps us, you know, pave the path for um, expanding to other health plans and employers all over the country. So, uh, you know, if you're lucky enough to get a call from a partner that um, really can help propel you forward, it's uh, you know, I think a very important relationship on both sides. And um, we're grateful that Primera was, uh, you know, really looking for a company like ours to meet the same goals. And how about you, Rob, anything that would uh, make other companies out there prepared for the big partner call? Yeah, I'd say uh, even as you're a small company or a medium company and you're, you're focused on the next year or two of what you're trying to accomplish, have an idea and a clear vision of, of where you're trying to get five, 10 years from now, so that when a partner like Primera comes to talk to you, you are able to align on that long-term vision and mission and build that trust. Beyond that, have a sense for what your bottlenecks to scaling and growth are, and hopefully have a plan for how you can sort of mitigate those bottlenecks. Uh, and so when that time comes, you're not scrambling to, to try to figure it out in the moment, whether that be technical or, or human, human process related. Rick, any uh, closing thoughts on that front? I think they've summarized it well. I think uh, having spent some time in their world and some time here, um, you never know when that call will come, but I think having a very strong point of view on what you think the world should be like, understanding the path to get there, and then when that call comes, being ready to ramp quickly are the most important things you can do. And um, we continue to look for companies just like them to support a lot of different things. And I think the culture and climate that they have at these two companies in particular were perfectly aligned for that moment. Amazing. Well, I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. Uh, Stephanie Papes, CEO of Boulder Care, Rob Schweitzer, Chief Product Officer 98.6, and Rick Abbott, VP Product and Market Solutions at Primera Blue Cross and Blue Shield. And to our audience, thanks so much for being part of today. Uh, again, thanks so much to Primera for their sponsorship, um, as not only for this uh, panel, but also for the Health Tech Podcast. And also uh, make sure to put on your calendar that roundtable next week where we'll be talking to the CFOs about insights on a changing economy, talking to folks from Adaptive Biotech, Rover, and Aptio. You can check that out at www.geekwire.com uh, forward slash events. And last but not least, join us, become a member. You can do it at an individual or corporate level, geekwire.com slash memberships.
again, thanks so much to the panelists for your time today, your insights and your inspiration, and uh, hoping that everyone can uh, keep uh, working and innovating safely during these tough times. <laughs>